uh, th this is an introduction. In the fall of 1983, I was invited by Ray Cass to Mountain Lake in Virginia to conduct a mushroom foray with real mycologists, Arson K. Miller, Jr., and his wife, Hope H. Miller. I myself am just an amateur. One evening, I was to give a talk, bringing together my devotion to the arts and my love of mushrooms. I decided to write a new text in the same way that I had written themes and variations, but the new one would not be, as themes and variations is, misostics on the names of people who have been important to me in my life and work. It would be misostics on the Latin names of mushrooms. That's why the title is partly in Latin. Mushrooms that I have enjoyed collecting in the woods and fields, and later eating in the evening at dinner with friends. I wrote a library of misostics, five different ones on each of 12 mushroom names, repeated five times, 60 texts in all, each one setting out from a chance determined one of the 110 ideas I'd listed in the course of a cursory examination of my books. Then using I Ching chance operations, I used these 60 syntactical texts to make one which was non-syntactical, a renga, since it came from a plurality of sources rather than a single one, and since it is long rather than short, like haiku. Mushrooms et variationes is one more in an ongoing series. Writings which, though coming from ideas, are not about them, yet nevertheless unintentionally produce them. More time is given to misostics on the name Craterellus conicopioides than to the others because of the letrist events which are to be vocalized are pronounced halfway between speech and song. These letrist events were triggered by the idea love, one of the 110 ideas mentioned above. I've noticed that when people are in love, they are frequently perfectly happy together, making no sense at all. Uh, this evening, as you know from your programs, the percussion group from Cincinnati is playing a piece um, in um, memory of Jean Arp while I read the text. Instead, between that two deal more in becoming and after, not lying between, instead of in latter case both, I'm every atom because relationship between them takes working path, both only when they're on track as much in space, always but now, formed, written emptiness, ready to receive, upsets what's had in mind. Each there's now enlightened is worthy. Less shall I do. I remember passivity, acceptance of being at once center, foot of land, continued by listing every part she found. Much gravity aspect of energy, she had written me. Motor enlightened. Now and more and then. We believe he found miserable thee. Shift very you are like my conversation at table gone to the movies, its main direction that came up with lovely sounds and nature to block out the 
wouldn't let them hurt them either. Once more, begging for no matter what. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Jeff Arnell, the Executive Director of the Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center here in Asheville, North Carolina. And today we are so happy to host a conversation about the fantastic recently published book, John Cage, A Mycological Foray. We're extremely lucky to have Atelier Edition's collaborative team with us. This includes Pascal Georgief, publisher and editorial director, Kingston Trinder, author, publisher, and entrepreneur, connecting with us from Montreal. And also joining us, we're extremely happy to have you here, Laura Kuhn, director of the John Cage Trust, connecting from New York. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much uh, for your incredible work and for making time for this conversation. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Jeff. Um, before we dive into the publication, I was hoping, Laura, if you could tell us a bit about the recording that we just heard. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. It's uh, part of our archives. We have a huge archive in, uh, at Bard College, which is in Red Hook or um, Red Hook Annandale on Hudson, New York, which is upstate, not quite upstate, sort of mid-state. Um, and it's part of our audio archives. So we have a lot of recordings of Cage doing live performances, which that is from, I believe it's from Virginia Tech. I think he says that um, because it was a really, it was a work that was instigated by Ray Cass, who was part of the uh, Mountain Lake Workshop uh, project there where Cage made his watercolors along with many other people. But he was there for a mycological foray with, as he puts it, professional mycologists, which he didn't consider himself. Um, so it's just one of, it's just one of many, many, many recordings that we have. The funnest thing about our audio archives are the, is that there are a good, I don't know, several dozen cassette tapes that Cage himself, when he wasn't busy, would sit down in his house and simply record something. So he would record a piece or a a lecture or something that he had given, he would just read it into the cassette player. So we have a lot of recordings that weren't actually given or recorded in live settings, but rather he was in the kitchen doing this. That This is not one of them. You hear the applause, that's real. We didn't put in canned applause, you know. <laughs> that's amazing. Anyway. Yeah. And, and what a, a way to ground this conversation with uh, his voice and um, with uh, and, and, and from this uh, live um, performance slash reading. Um, I would love to start with um, the genesis of the project. So how, how did this project um, come about and come across, um, you know, uh, the world of uh, Atelier Editions and your work, uh, Kingston and Pascal? I mean, uh, the genesis of the project is uh, probably around the year that we uh, that we started at the Edition. We had started kind of looking into different archives and collections um, to work on several uh, projects at once, and we had um, read some articles in cultural journals about John Cage's interest in mushrooms. So I think that's really the genesis: is just being like, oh, what a a curious idea that this person um, had this this parallel life, and at some point, I think a few years after we we'd started being interested in this, so 2017, I think we started um, I kind of researching different things. And Kingston had um, found that UCS um, UC Santa Cruz University of California Santa Cruz had this collection of uh, mycological kind of and, and na nature-based um, archives of John Cage. And we were going up there um, for something else. And he said, let's go visit, let's go see what's in there. And that's kind of the genesis, was going to see and dig around um, through the archive. And then from there, I mean, from there. I think the other thing is that we, you know, John Cage is such a sort of well-examined herb, right? And this felt mm -hmm. like a kind of um, a curiosity, a sort of an unusual aside that, you know, perhaps, you know, vehement John Cage admirers were were aware of. We certainly weren't. We thought that this man has been so sort of, you know, examined and thought of and spoken of and, and uh, deified even mm -hmm. perhaps. Uh, but this didn't feel like it had necessarily been explored to the to the greatest extent it could be. And also, you know, having <laughs> been sexually curious about it all, we thought we'd, you know, we'd head out from Los Angeles and see what the what the fuss was about. We do tend to find things that are almost anecdotal and then 
find out that there's a lot more depth to them. And if there is, then it becomes kind of a-, a Down a, the rabbit a, hole. A, down the, the rabbit there. hole we went, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's the, the that's genesis. That's the genesis. Yeah. It, and what, what was uh, the timing of that? So 2017, I believe the first time we visited the archive um, in the summer of, because we were up, we were doing a couple projects up in the Bay Area. We were living in Los Angeles at the time. So it was a, basically an excuse to road trip at the same time and go visit some, some but campuses. I think the other thing we should probably say, Jeff, is that we had initially imagined that the book would be a, much like a previous book we made at the Harvard Art Museum's Forbes Pickering Collection. It would be a book centered upon this collection itself. And mm -hmm. then a revelatory conversation with uh, Laura, Laura Kuhn, Kuhn. <laughs> occurred within which the project oriented significantly, but I'll, I'll let Laura talk to that. Yeah, um, the, yeah. yeah, the archive visit, we took um, over a thousand photographs of various objects and really kind of dug in and, and then realized that that was this teeny tiny portion of everything that, that it really meant in terms of uh, Cage's writing and creation and collaborations. Um, so that whole process is kind of a, a longer one when it comes to the book, um, but... I, I it, think just to add to that, that, you know, more from not, there's a tendency perhaps to subconsciously believe that whatever is archived is somehow significant. <laughs> and that isn't necessarily the case. I, I, I might interject something about that archive. So Please. that, when Cage was alive for many years, for maybe like the last eight or nine years of his life, he had this uh, idea because he was buried in paper. So he had this idea that he would establish so-called uh, topical collections mm -hmm. with people who were game to do that. And that particular little archive was run by a woman uh, named Rita Bottoms, who's still very much alive. She did a little book called uh, Riffs and Ecstasies, that it has a foreword by Ferlinghetti. Whoa. And, <laughs> yeah. It's a, just a little book that came and went. I'm not even sure you can buy it on the secondary market anymore. But um, and it's full of her, uh, just like maybe one page about each artist who kind of came through or that they managed some papers of that person. But we would have this practice. I worked with Cage, as you know, Jeff, from about 1985 until he died in 92. And one of the practices in the house was we had these transfer boxes in a closet. One was marked nature, one was marked music, and one was marked humanities. And those were the three archival places where stuff went. So those boxes would catch um, Otherwise, one might think of them as like ephemera, you know, mm -hmm. junk mail, stuff that was timely, but, <laughs> you know, it was, he didn't want to keep it. So anything that had to do with nature, which of course included mycology, went into that box. And when the box got full, one of my jo jobs in the house was to organize it, pack it, and then send it off to Rita. And Rita, that was for nature and mycology. Northwestern University was for music, and Wesleyan University was for literature, which mm -hmm. mostly included, but mostly contained things like poetry readings, notices about poetry readings. Every now and then, something would get in one of those boxes that really should not be sent away from a post-cage point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, meaning that I, I made it a point. I didn't go out to UCSC, um, probably should at some point in my life. Rita's no longer there. <laughs> unfortunately. But, um, you know, I went out to say Wesley and I spent several days just going through these boxes, which by the way, are almost impossible to catalog hmm. because they, they just have such a hodgepodge. But anyway, the, it's that, that little archive is really just catching the overflow of materials that Cage didn't want, you know, they didn't want to keep. And that's where that's yeah. where Atelier started. We do have to say that in there there were things that, that did seem a little less junk and just maybe things that of were course. of the past. Of um, course. I started you know. to yes. I started yeah. to say that when I went to Wesley and I spent days there, I went through all these boxes. There were like hundreds of these boxes. 
totally uncatalogued. And I just went through them and pulled out about five things that mm. really should not have been there. They, you know, they were uh, first edition of uh, essay, another piece of his, that it was a catalog from the first installation. It's like, we didn't even have this, you know, and how it ended up there. You got the good stuff. <laughs> I pulled out the good things and I had to convince, you know, the powers that be at Wesley. And it's like, I'm taking these. <laughs> Well, it sounds like it was just the tip of the iceberg and it just um, mm -hmm. brought you to the, the cage trust and to Laura. And this is the perfect kind of um, segue into the next question that I have for y'all is it's a multi-part question um, about the collaborative process. And um, as you know, um, f from um, various conversations and, and knowing the history of, of Black Mountain, our museum is always interested in these larger kind of collaborative projects that really look past uh, silos and past uh, discipline and how um, folks work together, professional and amateur and, and all of the different things that uh, we find uh, interesting and um, really um, give, give projects that uh, extra bit of spark. And when we heard about your book and uh, it just screamed that. And so we uh, were so excited to see it. And it's such a beautiful, um, not only it's the layout and it connects so much with um, the history and with uh, Cage's uh, direct writing, direct work, but then it has a fresh kind of perspective to it. So the, how does the research, the writing, the editing, and the design all work together and in this collaborative process with your your team plus Laura mm -hmm. plus Cage. So this is a lot to unpack, but uh, let's let's see what happens. <laughs> um, great question. Yeah, it's a great and loaded question for sure. Um, I think I again? think uh, well, this is obviously not an unusual. Uh, it's not a, an experience um, exclusive to a TV edition, but obviously once we have the sort of genesis of an idea, in this case it was of course, you know, mentioned the tip of the iceberg, uh, we all dream up, so when I say we, Pascal Capucin and myself, dream up the, what we imagine is the best way to realise this thought. So for example, with John Cage and Michael of the foray, a sort of somewhat immediate idea was let's try and recreate in a publication the experience of a mycological foray led by John Cage, you know, which is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty obvious idea, but it, but the way within which we thought to realize that was arranging some of Cage's mycologically oriented indeterminacy stories throughout a long sort of labyrinthine, sinuous narrative, wandering, if you will, through the landscape of Cage's mind and thoughts on mycology, encountering these indeterminacy stories in a way in which you would serendipitously encounter mushrooms in upstate New York. Kingston's doing everything except using the word chance, which is actually oh, yes. the cage also that. term, which <laughs> I love. Like this is a very Kingston thing, and this is where uh, collaboration actually gets read through the More whole. of a dictatorship. So obviously Kingston's <laughs> the writer in all of this, but um, the, the notion of chance was really kind of yes, key sorry, in true in every every step of the way. Um, so obviously Kingston wrote an essay that was very much about also kind of the foraging process and, and keeping um, with all of Cage's kind of uh, mycological experiences, but also in the layout itself and the design. So Kipusin, uh, our design director, very much um, had to answer to that need, which yeah. was the fact that there are a lot of, of very kind of parallel narratives happening within one book and we wanted Cage's voice to be one that was heard in a, in a different way or read in a different way and that one could kind of navigate the book through these stories and decide to read very separately um, what was his words versus uh, the rest and also you know going through everything and, and deciding to have the book open on his words um, was really important to us as well. So Cage actually has his own foreword in this book, even though it was made posthumously. Um, so that was a part of the, the process as well. I, and I mean, collaboratively speaking, working with Laura was kind of, and, and Emmy at the John Cage Trust, that was essential for us to understand, you know, which works might have mushrooms in them. 
because that was really kind of the brief we gave ourselves is like, where are their mushrooms? And then dig and dig and dig and forage for them and looking for where there might be an association to mushrooms in nature um, to be able to kind of build a compendium of mushroom related works that then get entwined with this essay that explains to us that side of the cage. Um, One of the words of caution that came up quite quickly in the process was the idea of creating a scrapbook. Yeah, i.e. Right. just assembling an, an enormous amount of mycological ephemera yeah. tangentially or directly related to cage and i think that's where sage laura coon came in and advised us <laughs> where the parameters of importance versus ephemerality versus you know superimposing our own imagined mm -hmm. uh, importance upon certain images or compositions or anecdotes or whatever for sure. Uh, and being selective in the process, um, for sure. And I think right there, you know, for us that what became the two anchors of, of the book uh, really were Mushroom Book, which we, we knew of the most, um, you know, just from, from personal experience and actually kind of, uh, you know, personal interest. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a artist book, so we were more familiar with the format. Um, and then knowing that there was Mushrooms et Variation that's such an important right. um, kind of example of how mushrooms were integrated in something that, that Cage made um, and performed. And so that was a big part of it was working with Laura to see how to integrate these um, in the book uh, in a respectful way and seeing how to work with these, these kind of pieces. Um, and, you know, they bestowed upon us the capacity to reproduce both fully, which, you know, is, isn't something that's necessarily um we hadn't we anticipated could, we hadn't anticipated necessarily being able to do so so that really anchored the book into these two major pieces um and then we were able to kind of have the essay and the, the multiple narratives come in and support these two kind of main works uh, um, so, so also to add to that jeff i think one of the things in terms of the collaborative process was uh there are several narratives occurring simultaneously mm -hmm. right a visual one a, a, in some ways a, a compositional one and also just a, a chronological nar narrative one mm -hmm. and that the at least on the atelier editions part is you know pascal and i came to cage's work through his comp through his uh, writing mm -hmm. which obviously influenced how at least on my on the on the on the writing side led me to more of a sort of uh you know a, 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 what do you call it, a sort of a labyrinthine narrative centered around the indeterminacies, whereas obviously, you know, Cap is, is, Cap is in as a designer and a, a sort of aesthetic uh, mystic <laughs> was sort of, and, and Pascal as well, working much more with the images and the arrangements. So, yeah, when it came to imagery, that was um, a big part was knowing how to integrate um, things that would set a tone and a mood. So that's actually how we were using this collection that was a little bit more of ephemera to kind of immerse ourselves into the universe of, of you know, what it was at the time and what could have been collected at the time. And there was a lot of postcards, a lot of notes, some were um, nicer than others, we can put it that way. And there's a lot of unsigned photographs of, mm -hmm. of mushrooms. And then you just see, and you know, you had um, foraging guides in Catalan and in, in Polish and you know uh, it's stamp, stamp collections and stuff, and you know and all the membership cards and all these things that you're like whoa cool but at the same time that kind of sets a tone in a universe so selecting the ones that kind of really could tell that story and set the tone of each chapter and then also having these parallels of actual photographs of cage by these great photographers um, and each person who's whose work is in there it you know it's their voice it's their it's their archive and we wanted to make sure that it felt like a photo book for their pages as much as it felt like an essay for the pages that were only writing as much as it felt like a reproduction of mushroom book. Right. And so all these voices were really kind of important um, in, in the process. And again, having Cage be seen as the, main, the main author mm -hmm. of this book, even though it's done again, posthumously. Um, yeah, it felt like a lovely way to enliven both Cage's voice, but also the, um, just, I guess, some to break the sort of, you know, often perceived static nature of archives is to kind mm -hmm. of enliven it and nourish it in a sort of contemporary yeah. and, you know, re reorienting perspective of both Cage, but also the archive of the, the Michael yeah. collection as well seems quite important to us. Mm -hmm. And again, Laura was very, you know, was invaluable to that as well, the whole process. Guiding light. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
I think the only other thing I can say is also, you know, there is a format that's dictated when you're working with something um, like a reproduction. So we didn't go for an exact facsimile, um, but everything's quite proportional. So actually even in design we had, um, so the process of, of, of making these books, Gifferson and I work very closely on kind of dreaming up the object and seeing how we can answer to the needs of the, of the publication itself. And Mushroom Book really was this very strong guiding voice in how, how to make this book because it, it really dictated the size, how to make an unbound portfolio into something that becomes, you know, user friendly today, how to bring that archive, um, that archival object into the, you know, onto a shelf in an affordable way, as well as in a kind of way that, that echoes the experience. If you go to MoMA right now, you can look at the portfolio, the same at the John Cage Trust and in various places, but you can go in there with your white gloves and have this unfurling of an object. So how do we bring that into people's homes mm. so that that also immerses them in that world? So that, you know, I have to say that Mushroom Book really was the kind of, the, 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 the foundation. The foundation to the design of the object because it, it yeah, it, it won most of the battles we had, you know, in all of this. Um, so that's we're legion. <laughs> yeah. That, that's amazing. Uh, Laura, um, when, when you were brought into the process and the research, um, talk a bit about um, your, your kind of perspective on, you probably have so many projects and so many folks from around the world that contact you and are interested in, in, um, in John Cage's work. And um, what, what kind of stood out, um, you know, for you uh, with this project? Yeah, you know, one of the most interesting things that I remember was that the, I, so when Kingston and Pascal came to visit for the first time and, learning about their interests and their surprise about John Cage and mycology, which Pascal was just talking about when she began speaking. And I remember thinking, everybody knows about Cage and mushrooms. How is that possible, you know? But really, I started to talk with people. I, you know, people I respect, colleagues, you know, Siglio, you know, and I said, you know, that I have these publishers, these editors with Atelier, and they want to take this on. What do you think about this idea? <laughs> and they all said, oh my God, I think that's fantastic. I don't think anybody really knows about Cajun mushrooms. And it turned out that that was pretty true when I began to speak out in the world with people that they may have known this, but it was like back of the head kind of thing. Like it wasn't all that. It wasn't, you know, terribly important. But the truth is, is that mushrooms were central to Cage in so many ways. I mean, one, just one little thing that people don't really know is that, you know, that Cage became known for a certain way of dressing. That when he was a young man, he wore suits and smoked his, you know, his uh, cigarette holder cigarettes. And he always looked so dapper and so sharp. And starting in the early 1950s, he changed to blue jeans and black Nike sneakers. You know, he looked like a bag man a lot of the time in the city. <laughs> but he did that so that he would be ready at a moment's notice to jump out of the car and hunt for mushrooms while he was driving, you know, in the Volkswagen bus on the tours or when he was with friends or whatever. So even his clothing was driven by his love of, of uh, foraging for mushrooms. So it quickly became an important book. Long before it was designed, long before we knew what was going into it, it became this important extension of knowledge about John Cage uh, in a way that I hadn't anticipated. And Pascal and, and Kingston had in a way because they didn't know about it and they had done a lot of research trying to figure out whether or not this would be a useful book. So I just wanted to bring that up that they actually brought the idea my work really had to do with, as, as again, as Pascal brought up, of putting things in front of them, you know, so when they were here, it was really just saying, okay, that piece, that's never actually been published, but we have this manuscript, or Emmy, could you pull this book off the shelf? Or, and maybe like Mushrooms and Vari Variationes was published in, it was published once in a book, but it was a, a very little known journal 
it was not something that most even cage people knew about. So we pulled that off the shelf. It's like here. Then the search was, did we have the original uh, manuscript to work from? And it turned out the original publication was full of errors. <laughs> so <laughs> that was another process. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and yes, backbreaking. I mean, boy, you know, between Pascal and I were on the phone, I don't for easily th two, three weeks straight, yeah. just proofing this masostic and yeah. finding errors. <laughs> Poor Emmy. Emmy was going blind doing this yeah. with this little tiny print. Um, so, the, you know, the collaboration really for me was with the archives. It was really with the materials. It's like, what's here? What do you want to do? And, and Pascal talks about the mushroom book. That one, it won all the arguments in the sense that that's a, it's an artwork. We don't actually think of that as an archival object. We think of it as part of our art collection. Right. It's a portfolio, it's an artist portfolio, and it does have certain needs, as all artist portfolios do, if you want to try to reproduce them. Mm -hmm. This one was particularly challenging because each folio in, the, in their 10 in the artist portfolio has three sheets, and yeah. they're meant to be viewed one and then two laying on top of three, so tissue on something else. So it's a work that from from my experience is not seen by people because yeah. there's no way to exhibit it. it mm -hmm. It's a, they're, they're folded sheets. Mm -hmm. So we did for the New York Mycological Society one year, we have three portfolios here. One is now cut up. <laughs> so wow. we literally dismantled it in each folio into three pieces of paper so that they could be framed and shown, but still, nobody's looking at it the way you're supposed to look at it, which is this sheet and then and the tissue on top of the next sheet. Yeah. And, and really you guys, Kingston and Pascal, really just took to that. It was like, I think we could do something with that. You know, I think, and it turned out to be the only way to reproduce this, this object in a way that was true to the object. So I'm not surprised you say that it won all the arguments because it, yeah. Yeah, it just tells you what to do. It's like, I don't think so. I don't think so. And yeah. then you try something else and it finally resonates, you know? Right. So, anyway, those are my, that's my two cents. <laughs> that's amazing. And, and I collaborated endlessly on his essay. <laughs> he was extremely patient. So you, you can't describe David Tudor that way. It's like, why not? You know, it's like because the time frame is all wrong. He wasn't composing yet. You know. <laughs> oh, you've got to tell okay. us more about this. This is really great. Uh, um, what What do you uh, What do you think about that, Kingston? Um, that. Bouncing that around with Laura. Oh, the process you meant. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, the process. Not the <laughs> not the nitty the gritty. No, right. Uh, I suppose. Well, I suppose once that. I, as I mentioned earlier, I came to Cage's work really through his writing, mm -hmm. um, and and perhaps, <laughs> uh, perhaps not necessarily usually, I didn't come to his music compositions until afterwards, much later in life, in fact, I was much more familiar with his writing. And so when I went to write the, you know, the, the sort of central essay, I suppose I, A, perhaps unconsciously was sort of more fixated on the writing, but B, was probably making unconscious romantic assumptions and visions that Laura very kindly brought some clarity and authenticity to. And I think between us, we struck a, well, at least in my mind, a, a good balance of, well, the right balance, sorry, of fact and romance. There was also a whole editorial- I believe that to be the case. It. Remember, we, we went through, you know, Ananda Pedrain was oh, editing yeah. text with Kingston from the start as well. And then we had a sub editor and a yes. proofreader involved. And then there was the Laura intervention, which was yes. another stage. So that's where it became very exhaustive <laughs> and you have different levels of uh, academic thought coming in, not necessarily different levels, but just different academic um, bodies, of bodies of knowledge. Yeah, we'll say we had someone from a philosophy background, Kingston, who's from anthropology and writing and journalism, and Laura, who's just from the school of Cage, you know, that's just this kind of um, authority, really. So it was quite interesting because there was very differing perspectives on how best to do it. And I, I interrupted, but yeah, I just wanted to. But I think one of the, maybe the one most beautiful things that came out of the long conversations Laura and I had is that you brought in um, 
in the very last chapter of the text, you brought in uh, Kumaraswamy. Yeah. And I thought that was something, I guess the, obviously, you know, to, to attempt to write an essay about John Cage is already a sort of, <laughs> it's, a, um, it's an endeavour. Um, but I suppose what I'm getting at is that there was a sort of, perhaps there was a pretty strong endoskeleton to, to the essay and Laura really brought in the, brought in some of the substance that was perhaps lacking here and there towards the end. I, you know, I, I spent a lot of years with Cage, and that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily an authority, but I know what he hated. <laughs> so, so I'm sensitive, you know, I'm sensitive when I'm reading something, I think, oh my God, John would just die to hear somebody describe that as that, or, or using a kind of language. He's very particular. You know, right. he was very particular. It, it reminded me, though, of uh, all of the artists that I've known and loved, really loved them, both as people, but also their work, are like this. And Rauschenberg, I remember this beautiful exchange we had one time. I was down in Florida visiting him, and we were sitting in the kitchen drinking, and but he had a stack of books to my left, big kitchen island. He was there, and I was here. And I was just looking at the titles and I saw a book by Brandon Joseph. No, it wasn't Brandon Joseph. God, take that back. I can't remember which author and it's probably better given what I'm gonna to say to you. <laughs> that I pulled this book out and I said, oh my God, that this book has a huge chapter about you and John Cage. I have to, do you have a pen? I need to write this down. And he said, oh, take it, you can have it. Hmm. And I said, no, I, I can, I'll buy it. I can go. And he says, I absolutely refuse. It will just encourage the author. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't want all of your work to be, you know, chastised or pushed right. away by the people that I really love and respect. You know, they didn't want them thinking that you were a moron, you know, for having used a particular <laughs> word, you know. It's, you have to be careful. You know, yeah. you just have to be careful in, in the cage world. And I suspect that that's yeah. also true for the Jasper Johns world and the Rauschenberg world and people of that generation, that ilk, you know. And you took to it very well. You didn't fight with me very much, but there were times <laughs> when I thought, <laughs> where did you get this, you know? I have to say there is kind of a, a, a lot of writing out there that venerates Cage and I yeah. think there is this kind of level of being very not being very aware of the fact that there's an audience that really put him up on this pedestal and it was quite um, heartwarming but also quite useful to be discussing uh, all these things with someone like you Laura that that removes the pedestal keeps him somewhere really important but you know, takes makes it more familiar because that mm. was Cage's kind of approach. And so to be reminded, you know, if he was familiar in 1972, then he should still be today. Uh -huh. I think that's something, you know, I feel like we got there with with this publication was to keep it kind of non. Um, you to be admiring a, but less reverential. Reverential, yeah, yeah. you know. You can't get close to someone like John Cage like anybody who's really well known and really so accomplished at what they right. do, you can't get close to them personally if you venerate them. Exactly. You just can't, you know, they're just human beings. Right. You know, he struggled. I said to him, I remember when he was starting his Harvard lectures. So he was, this would have been in uh, 88. Okay, so he was, what was he then? He was 75, 76, mm -hmm. right. and he couldn't get started. He just couldn't get started. And this went on for days and he would pace and I didn't have anything to do because my job was to help him do that which he needed to do. I cleaned the house, I, I went through photographs. It turned out archivally speaking to be incredibly useful time <laughs> given what happened. But at the time, and I remember I lost my patience with him one time and I said, you know, I just can't believe this is so hard. I mean, at your age, you know, you've been doing this a long time. I should think it gets easier. <laughs> and he said really sharply and he almost never raised his voice at me, but he said, no, it just gets harder. <laughs> and I realized in that moment, and this sounds so romantic, but it was really true, that he, he was truly an experimental person, that he didn't, he didn't repeat himself. And so everything that he came to that was put in front of him to do, he had to 
interact. He had to collaborate with the subject. He had to collaborate with the work to find out the best way to do what he was going to do. And as he got older, he had less energy. You know, mm -hmm. as you age, you don't have the strength that you had when you were 50 or 20 or whatever. So that's what he meant when he said, no, it just gets harder. And of course it does, of course. You know, there's for him no such thing as repetition, no such thing, it didn't exist. So, so you have to be careful when you, you know, when you fall back on Joan Ritalik, do you all know this name? Yeah, so Joan Ritalik, she's a, a, a poet, she's emeritus, I think, here at Bard now, I'm not sure that she's still mm -hmm. teaching. I haven't seen her in about a year or so. But anyway, I remember Joan Ritalik. It's in her uh, interviews that she did with Cage, uh, not too long before Cage died also. It's published in a book called Music Cage, Cage Muses mm -hmm. on words, art, and uh, music. And she, she asked him some question. I don't remember what it was. This is in the recording and also in the transcript. And Cage said, his pat answer. We call it, you know, calling the answer in or, and she said, oh, for heaven's sakes, I've never believed that answer. What do you mean by that? You know, and it was so refreshing. It was just so refreshing to have somebody call him on uh, slipping into that repetition of, of a way of saying something where, you know, anyway. So the, all of that came into play, working right. with Kingston on his essay. It's like, you can't, you can't just lift, oh, the, the thing I referred to, David Tudor. I said, right. don't call David Tudor a composer. In 1954, he was not a composer yet. He was a pianist and a fantastic pianist. The co composition came later. Right. But we all now, anybody coming to David Tudor now, David Tudor was a pianist and a composer. Right. You know? yeah. And he became a composer of great, great, great note, because right. he did live electronic music, which was a very, very big deal. Right. But at the time, he was just a pianist, just a great pianist, you know. So I was trying to impress that. I said, you can't call him a composer. It rings <laughs> false, you know. <laughs> anyway. I, I love that. And it's so inspiring to kind of uh, just kind of remember um, that experimental nature uh, mm. throughout his the arc, yep. the entire career and entire life all the way back to California. Yep. Um, it's just, it's mind blowing. And it's, I agree. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful that that made its way into um, the book and the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it really does um, radiate out from it. Um, mm -hmm. Laura, could you um, tell us more about your work with the, the John Cage Trust? And, and tell um, our audience how uh, they could stay um, maybe more active or you know, stay tuned with your work and kind of uh, c connect sure. with you. I'll do it quickly for you because it's, you. You know, it's a lot of material, but um, essentially John Cage died in 1992, somewhat surprised. You know, it was a surprising death. He wasn't, he didn't uh, linger like Merce did for years and years. John just died one day, he had a stroke and he died within about 12 hours of having had a stroke. I became, I founded the John Cage Trust really to uh, maintain the sanity of those of us who were left behind. Because while John Cage may have left, well it's true, it's really true, mostly me and Merce. But even though John had died, the interest in his work didn't die. You know, so, and John had always been the greatest resource to people. You could, he was in the phone book. You could call him up and say, can I come over? I'd like to interview you. And he'd say, okay, would you like to have lunch? And he would make lunch for you, you know? So all of a sudden he wasn't there. And um, there were people who still wanted to do things with him, so to speak, which meant they needed access to the loft, which is where he, John worked with, his home with Merce. So we really started the John Cage Trust to maintain our sanity. I was living in Arizona at the time. I was teaching at ASU. So I was bouncing back and forth. After about, I don't know, it was like about six months of this, I had no health. I had no friends. You know, I was on an airplane every three weeks coming out because Merce would say, oh, these people want to come in and film the house, but I have to be on tour. Can you be here? Mm -hmm. He didn't trust his home to strangers who would, you know? Yeah. So it really, the John Cage Trust was formed 
really uh, in response to the need for some structure around continued interest in John Cage. So we, from the get-go, we've been an incredibly responsive organization. That isn't to say that we don't produce things. After about three years of being responsive, even I, <laughs> the girl in the family, <laughs> got tired of being the nurturer, being the helper, being the, you know, and said, excuse me, you know, I'd like to put on a play. I'd like to produce a concert. I'd like to, and my board was thrilled because it was so unusual for an archive to do that. Archives tend to be, as uh, Kingston, you said, and I cringed, but you said the static nature of archives. <laughs> I'm thinking there's nothing static about our archive right. at exactly. all, but it's unusual. That's unusual. Right. So that's, it's been, it is an organization which is both proactive and responsive at the same time, which is a dream job quite frankly. It's a great place to be uh, if you have a kind of creative bent. If you're entrepreneurial in some way, you can, you can find things to do and do them. Because another adage that I used to say when we formed the John Cage Trust that I've lived by, and it's really challenged right now, but that is, you know, we're not as interested in what Cage did as we are in what Cage is doing now. Yeah. And that's, and I mean that so sincerely, you know, that we're, I'm, I'm not so interested in holding things still as I am to see how Cage works in the world. What is Cage doing, you know, through mm -hmm. other people. And that's thrilling. I mean, that's really thrilling. So it's also, once I begin to work with someone, as in the case of Atelier, it's really helping them do their work in a way that's consistent with that which they want to do. It's really that. And that's, there's a fine line there because people don't like to be told what to do. And frankly, I don't like to tell people what to do. So it's sort of like guiding the horse over to the water, you know, and saying, you know, here, here. So the John Cage Trust, it's both a business entity and it's an archive. So the archive started just with whatever John Cage had amassed in his life. And that's what started our archive. But really, we started more as a business. We started more as someone to take care of the copyright, someone to deal with requests, someone to organize materials and make sure people got what they needed. And the archive has done nothing but grow. Um, since since we started. So we probably quadrupled in size at least, probably tenfold. I mean, really. We add, we have a, two libraries. We have a John Cage Trust Library and we have John Cage's Personal Library. John Cage's Personal Library is static. It is fixed. It is what it was when John died. And then the Cage Library, we probably add two or three items to it a, a week. So you can imagine it just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. So it's not a static place. Um, we, so we maintain libraries, we maintain print archives, we maintain manuscript, we have music manuscript and text manuscript both. We have a photographic collection. We have an art, a permanent art collection of about 100 works now. Um, we get, I don't know, one work, maybe a new work a year. People who die and leave us something or, you know, whatever. When Burst died, he gave us all of his cage works, you know, anything that were in the house. So, And so we serve people both uh, remotely and we serve them in situ. We encourage people to come. But right now, I mean, that's been almost impossible since uh, about February that, you know, that we visitors are few and far between. And when they're here, we have real mandates about how they behave and where they can be. And um, anyway, we just help people. We help people. So you want to do a concert, but you don't know what to play. You know, we make recommendations. You want to do a book. What do you want to do the book on? Mushrooms. Okay, come on over, you know, and you <laughs> dig through, the, you know. So so wonderful thank you laura it's uh, it's it's um and your the, the generosity of your spirit it you know really also continues in that way of 
the cage, inviting someone in for lunch, mm. um, and making we did lunch. that. We well, used to do that all the time. <laughs> it's so sad. But it's not just the folks on this call. It's really uh, so many um, cage enthusiasts and um, um, performers and scholars mm. and curators all over the world. So mm. thank you so much for your work. My pleasure. Really, my pleasure. Yeah, it, I would also really lo love to ask the same question about uh, Atelier Editions and about, um, you know, since 2015, how has uh, this collaborative project evolved? You've done so much since then and, you know, what, what's in the hopper and what, what's, uh, you know, what's in the what's hopper? Next? Great question. <laughs> um, so Atelier Edition, yeah, I mean, we're still pretty young. Um, Kinston and I started researching some books that are, you know, that now have all come out in those years. Um, but uh, basically, we work um, on a variety of books with collections, uh, archival materials. We try to bring out things that haven't really been seen before or cultural narratives that haven't really been discovered. Uh, we work with different researchers on, on similar things. Um, so I can say that, you know, our, our specialty is really kind of the, uh, the, uh, the French word is inusité. Um, it's um, something that's idiosyncratic. We'll usually pick our curiosity or something that feels a little bit like, oh, wait, is there more to this? Um, you know, telling stories that haven't been told before. Um, and so, you know, we work with archives in America and in Europe, and now we're up in, in Canada um, because 2020, um, and basically uh, have been working with, with various people. So we can say that what's coming up is um, we're working on a project with the USDA. They have a really beautiful uh, watercolor collection. So mm. palmological watercolors wow. is the next thing. Yeah, we nosedived into fruits and nuts. Um, and we're also uh, working with wonderful authors on um, books that are coming out in the autumn of next year on historic house museums in the American South, as well as one on British nudism in the 20th century, which is going to be quite intriguing. Um, and then also we are working with come? the... Yeah. We worked with the Harvard Art Museums to do the Atlas of Our Unfamiliar Color. That might be one of our more known books. That's um, one of my. That's one of my favorite books, by the way. Oh, fun! It, I love that book so much. That was a, yeah, that was a, a kind of a, a turning point for us because it was the first time that we were really welcomed somewhere with no red tape. Um, and, you know, working with one docent or one curator, in this case, it was uh, Narayan Kandekar, who is the director of the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies. So that houses the Forbes Pigment Collection and really kind of someone just saying, come on in and let's see, you know, what you want to make out of this. And it was a very similar experience to working with Laura and the John Cage Trust. It was just, you know, being welcomed in and saying, okay, let's see if there's a project for you. Let's work together to gather this information and, and let you make you know, some, something beautiful and um, contemporary at the same time as it can live on a shelf for as long as, as, as possible. Um, so right now we're working with, in terms of kind of Cage's contemporaries, we're working with the Creta Art Center on, yes. on, on a catalog of proserographs. That's kind of something super exciting and very long term. Um, so that should be expected in the next um I'd say 18, 20 some odd months. So that's a really, really exciting project that we're working on. So we try to keep it balanced between photographic material, archival material, and also some um, kind of contemporary essays that have to do with cultural histories. Um, and I think those are the ones that are, are kind of, that we can speak of. I, I would also add to that, Jeff, that as uh, two foreigners, Pascal's French Canadian, as you know, I'm from New Zealand originally, uh, we have, for whichever reasons, an enduring fascination with American culture. Yeah. So we have this ongoing series called the um, the Illustrated America, which is a sort of uh, a vast survey of past and contemporary sort of American cultural phenomena. Mm -hmm. Often we like to think interpreted <laughs> perhaps in an I mean, there's just something so obviously. Pat and I both lived in the U.S. for a long time. It's such a an extraordinary country, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> particularly this year. <laughs> Becoming more so every day. Right. Definitely and it's right. absolutely <laughs> fascinating. I mean, yeah. and, and for whichever reasons, you know, the three partners of the Tilly Editions, two French Canadians and myself and New Zealand, um, it, it's, 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 it's an endless and vast 
source of inspiring and idiosyncratic material, mm. you know, anthropological curiosities that you could never imagine you mm. both produced <laughs> from the US. So an extraordinary, it's, it's an archival sort of um, paradise in a sense. That there are so many individuals with so many bizarre niche interests with, and mm. often the means to preserve those, those fascinations has really for us been, it's a constant pleasure discovering America's cultural history. There, yeah, there's a lot of rabbit holes to descend upon, and I think right. that's kind of what we what we'd like to continue doing. Um, but right. never say never. Uh, we did do some events and so forth in the past, but that's something that um, you know this year has has shifted us towards uh, burying our noses back into books. Um, but we can say that there are some really fun things down the pipeline, and that we're open to suggestions if anyone yes. is trying to you know research something further we're we've been very open to various things we might actually be working on our first um, Spanish language book as well so that's oh. a challenge for the, the, the Frenchies and the, the Anglo-Saxons on board. Um, I, I think just also add to very briefly that Jeff is that something um, Laura mentioned too with the work of John K. Truss is that we'd, one of the things that the editions has sort of felt from the get-go is to enrich uh, well, sorry, to, to sort of reinterpret and to kind of reinvigorate archives, yeah. archival mm -hmm. material in the sense that, you know, I keep using this word static, and I think that's not even, a, that's not fair or true, but uh, there is a perception often that, you know, archive of static entity sort of, um, lo you know, locked away from the world that are, and are often inaccessible in a way, and we want to make, one of our mandates is to make those much more accessible, much more, you know, universal, much more sort of you know, contemporary mm -hmm. events. I mean, yeah. Placing John Cage as an author front and centre was very important, even though we were working obviously posthumously with a lot of archival material. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear a lot of times from people, I, I mean, it's not every day, but it's enough to be remarkable that when people call me or come to see me and they want to look at something or they want to do some research or they want, they're, they're, they comment on, at how easy it is right. relative to other archives. Right. You know, relative, they just say, that's all? That's all I have to do? You know, say, <laughs> yeah. like you know, so I, I don't have a lot of experience. I wasn't trained as an archivist. I mean, I made this all up over the last 20 years, really. But apparently a lot of places, it's much more difficult yes, to it get is. in. It's much more difficult to do your work. It's much more restricted. And yeah. what you can and can't do, and mm -hmm. right. so. that is the the beauty of um. I mean, we'll say this: so we've found that there are certain kind of newer twentieth century archives that are much more open, and that want, um, you know, contemporary makers to come in and keep it active, keep it moving, keep it, yeah. you know, a creative space. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of new residency programs that do similar things. And it's it's been really kind of a lovely community as well. Like we really aren't the only people diving no, no. into these worlds. And um, the one thing about the the independent book world is that it's a really generous one as well. Um, you know, the community that, that we find everywhere becomes a permanent one. And it's really interesting to also see people exchanging materials. Um, you know, we're maybe one day we'll be the new Freemasons. It'll just be an interesting kind of way to exchange but it's been um especially working on this book i can just say just to kind of loop back into it it's been really interesting receiving notes from people that want to exchange about their own research on cage or these things that they've found or even we got a note from a woman who'd gone foraging with cage as a child because mm. her friend was lois long's daughter and then you go oh wait i actually know who you mean and you just kind of realize that you could you could dive into this world of exchange with so many people. Um, time is not always on your side there, but it's been really fascinating to see how you can reach people with with a book in a different way than you know we've worked in galleries and in different more kind of geographically firm um, projects. And something like this actually goes out and can make it on the shelf of of the right person or on the table, and they want to talk about it, which is really um, a gift in and of itself. Well, it's the life beyond the book itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Much perhaps like the work of the John Cage Trust and the yeah. Black Mountain yeah. College. But that's absolutely true with John Cage uh, across the board, which you were right. just, all of what you just said. You know, that it's like 
lift any rock and there's John Cage in America, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, when you, it doesn't matter who you're talking to, what kind of person you're talking to or what their field is, that more often than not, somebody will say, oh my God, I know that person. And I, you know, I have this connection. Right. Or this is, you know, that's a, that's a real privilege to, to be working in that way <laughs> with that person representing that out in the world because it, you have like a kind of open sesame <laughs> people in a way that you wouldn't have, you know, if you're representing... I don't know. Booker T. Washington or something. You know, in America, I'm saying, you know, in America, they would just look at you cross-eyed. You know, it's like, I don't know who that is. We, we have the good fortune, too, of having that exact um, privilege um, yes. where it is um, every single day our phone rings from someone somewhere in the world yep. who has uh, an interest in Black Mountain. And, and you know, of those maybe... 20, 50 calls, there's a cage call, you yep. know, there's yeah. a Rauschenberg yeah. call, there's a, a Merce Cunningham call. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, and in, in the archive too, I really love um, hearing y'all talk about, uh, it's something that we're working towards, is that how can we get better at um, making our collection and our archives available? Yeah, you know, we, we have always, I kind of have a, my, you know, those shelves, my list of, of kind of things that I've been immutable about. And one of them is, you know, thou shalt, I say this to Emmy, the minute she started working with me 13 years ago, I said, Emmy, thou shalt not do other people's work. Mm. You know, so that's really primary. And that means that you encourage them to come and do their own damn work. You know, if they call you up and say, it would be like Pascal, if you had called me, you and Kingston would call and say, we want to do about cage, a book about cage and mushrooms. What do you have? Yeah. You know, and I would have to go do your work. Right. But I said, don't, you know, come. We'll look at it together. We'll poke around together. Not because we're lazy. It's a big job to take a topic and amass a report for you that tells you. Mm -hmm. right. And it also bypasses your ability to have the joy of research, the right. joy of foraging and finding, right. you know. Right. Right. But I guess why I brought that up is that right now it's really hard because right. of 2020 and the pandemic and people can't get here. Right. So yeah. all of a sudden my thou shalt <laughs> has to go on the <laughs> shelf. You know, it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> you know, what do you need? Yeah. Not because I don't want to do their work, but it just really loses the whole right. pleasure of meeting people and them holding objects and you know, you know what I'm talking about. Right. Well, it's a new challenge for, for a lot of us to find a way to keep collaboration and interaction kind of alive, even though yeah. we're all, you know, in our little boxes wherever we stand and and um, even, I mean, for us, it's been, uh, you know, Kipusin is in Europe and we've always worked very much with exchange and so forth, but we're not meeting on, on the press. We're not going to kind of go sit down and workshop mm -hmm. something together for a week before going to print another book. And we don't have these kind of intense moments in 2020. So it's an interesting yeah. year for, for a lot of yeah. these kinds of projects. Um, and it's, yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, we'll, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the the book seems like it's doing extremely well. We uh, sold out of every copy that we had in our bookshop, and I were waiting. We have pre sales uh, for we're coming. The second yes. press. We're, and we're waiting for ours. <laughs> yes, they're coming. They're coming. We don't our... sell anything. We just give them away. But we give them away to really special people. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. Not so yeah. You know, but yeah. I want to say one more thing, you know, on the subject of me saying it's such a pleasure to represent John Cage in the world because mm -hmm. it opens doors and it people know him and he's he was beloved. And so there I I get benefit of that. And then you piped in, Jeff, by saying, you know, everybody knows Black Mountain, so you have this privileged place in the world where you're not right. You might have to straighten people out a little bit, but they know who you are. They know what this is, you know. And the other special thing about this book is that mushrooms are really having a new popularity. Uh, yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Right now, it, the book couldn't yeah. have come at a better moment, you right. know, because I work on a college campus where I'm surrounded by young people. We do a mycological weekend, mycology weekend every uh, year. Well, we 
we did. We didn't do, we're not doing one this year, unfortunately. Although it is out of doors, we could probably explore this, but not right now because climate's not right. Um, but anyway, my point is that a lot of young people would come on our, our, our weekend just to hear people talk about mushrooms. And the number of young people that I've met who are into the uh, regenerative qualities of yeah. mushrooms and the yeah. ecological mm -hmm. implications yeah. of mushrooms. Yeah. And so to find, you know, it's yet another way that John speaks to a continuing culture, you oh, know, yeah. which is, so anyway, the book um, opens doors because people say, oh my God, I love that book, yeah. you know? Yeah, it is, a, the audience is really kind of divided that way. There are There is quite the mushroom audience to the book that are discovering John Cage at the same time, which is, uh -huh. Which is not, kind of an unusual something, route. Well, it's not right. something they complain about at all. Um, but it, it's been interesting to hear the feedback from some people that really loved it for the, the mushroom aspect. And then we're just kind of discovering the writings and philosophies of John Cage and the story of this one person's experience with it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's part of what we try to do as well, is kind of have these, these entryways into people's Exactly. Universes. Um, yes, this all came to mind as you were talking because yeah. I'm thinking, you know, you want to enliven archives, you want to, you know, make materials that aren't really known, better known. Right. I would yeah. say that you've got a third kind of reader out there, and that's the reader who knows a little bit about John Cage and nothing about mushrooms, really. Nice. Yeah, who says, oh my God, I never knew that Cage was so into mushrooms. And I never knew so much about mushrooms, you know, so they're learning right. both at the same time. And that's really cool. I mean, that's really what you want from a book, isn't it? You know, yeah. you want people to love your book for all those reasons, you know. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. If we do yeah. it, do the yeah. job well. Um, exactly, exactly. Well, I think yeah. the book is beautiful. I mean, I, I couldn't yeah. be happier with it. I think it, it looks beautiful. I'm sorry that Cap is not here because the book is so nice, you know, it's just so nice. The design of it, it feels good in the hand. It really looks, it looks terrific. And it looks even more beautiful, Pascal, than, than you're bringing mock-ups and showing them to oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> she bring these things and like unfold them. And she tried to explain, you know, what, what yeah. was happening. I said, yeah, I'm sure it's gonna be great. I'm sure. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's another, that's another design challenge is trying to show a dummy to someone if they're totally. not- Who's a dummy? It's a dummy. It's a dummy. It's a dummy. <laughs> and, but yeah, that's part of the process as well. It's like trying to explain, yeah. you know, imagine if, imagine if the tactile did it out. It's beautiful, and I think the cage would, would like it for a number of really mundane reasons. One is that it's khaki. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's khaki colored. So it has a kind of populist feeling. Right. There's something mm -hmm. about that. The softness of the books, it has a kind of utilitarian feeling. You know, it's not, it's not this object that you're your that the spine won't bend or the you know what i mean it's got so many beautiful simple little things about it that are so in keeping with the subject matter yeah. and john would have loved it he just would have loved it that so was one of my last questions actually <laughs> and you, you touched on it what would john have loved about this and you answered mm -hmm. it intuitively i f i find it so beautiful as well and it, and it does have that kind of you know here's the, the the bind you know the box but it also has the delicate quality as well the paper mm -hmm. choice and there's so many um there was so much uh karen thought that you could really tell yeah. that went into it and um it is beautiful that's Thanks. all pascal and cap <laughs> yeah well we can say that i mean one thing that i hope he he would have loved is that actually his portfolio had to be hand assembled even if a machine was doing the folding yeah. so that's so <laughs> like there's you know, yeah. every single yeah. copy, there's there's hand gestures kind of that are a part of it. And um, we did integrate a paper that was made from the um, kind of industrial waste of apple oh, production um, in the same region as we were printing. So in the Sud Tirol, Perfect. that's mm -hmm. considered like almost zero kilometer material, but also it's kind of made out of non non 
paper pulp. Um, mm -hmm. And we thought that that was something that he would have been tickled yeah. by, you know, yeah. like actually bringing in um, food stuff into the production of a book about mushrooms. Just like it's edible papers, it's edible drawings. Exactly. You know? yeah. He said if all. things got really bad, you could cook up one of those drawings and have it for dinner. Yeah. I, I, well, same with the book. Just, I mean, yeah. Which is perfect for 2020. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you guys probably don't know this, and I, I wish I could point you to exactly where it is is in the archives, but Cage once said about five or six years before he died that in our lifetime that paper object books should be outlawed and that everything should be online, everything should be electronic because of paper waste and because really for ecological reasons. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while a book comes out like what you did that has to be a paper book. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It right. really yeah. needs to be a paper book. And then to go a step further to find out that you really gave very careful attention to if you're going to add to a paper book, a, to the paper books in the world, that this one is going to be recycled for a better, for lack of a better word, that right. it's, you're going to have that, that care going right. into the design and the production. So he would have loved that on top of, yes, he'll love, he would love the pictures. And he'd be pleased that you reproduced his mushroom book so, so nicely so that people can actually see it, you know? Right. So, yeah. Anyway. So yes, he'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Full answer. Right. Thank you so much, um, the three of you. And thanks again for all of your work, your lifetime of work um, that has led us to this point today. And um, I hope the best for our collective future. And, and I hope that we'll <laughs> stay in touch. Me too. <laughs> and um, I hope that y'all will visit us in Asheville um, and do maybe some research in the, the Southeast. Um, okay. and, um, Laura, we hope to see you in Asheville. Oh, I know. Again soon. It's been months since I've traveled. It's yeah. terrible, isn't it? Have you been out of the state? No, I haven't. Yeah. And um, I don't really it's have like, any plans. I, I go for long walks with my children, uh, teenagers. Uh -huh. And uh, um, so we, we've been spending a lot of time um, in, you know, in the woods as well. That's good. That's yeah. good. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Yeah. yeah thank, Thanks you. Much for thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Take all. Care. Take care, Laura. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.